Hello, everyone, and welcome to another PNP Live. My name is Bashan. I'm part of the event staff of Politics and Pros. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for this event. Uh, before we do get started, just a couple quick items that I'd like to go over. The first is that at any time during this event, you can go to the chat section where you can find a link which takes you directly to the Politics and Pros website where you can purchase a copy of Red Comet. Um, of course, we highly encourage and thank each of our loyal customers for your continued patronage. Um, additionally, if you would like to ask uh, a question of any of the authors of tonight's event, we would ask that you place it separately in the Q&A box, uh, not the chat box, just so we can try to help keep this um, organized and help facilitate the question and answer period. Um, that said, we would like to welcome Heather Clark uh, and her novel that I just mentioned, Red Comet. Uh, with a wealth of never before access materials, including unpublished letters and manuscripts, court police and psychiatric records, and new interviews, Heather Clark's Red Comet brings to life the brilliant Sylvia Plath, who had poetic ambition from a very young age and was an accomplished published writer of poems and stories even before she became a star English student at Smith College in the early 1950s. Uh, Clark will be in conversation today with Peter K. Steinberg. Uh, you, some of you may know Peter as the author of the biography, Sylvia Plath, and the introduction to the spoken word, Sylvia Plath. He has published several articles on Plath and is a co-editor of the two-volume, The Letters of Sylvia Plath, and a co-author of These Ghostly Archives, The Unearthing of Sylvia Plath. Uh, without further ado, Heather Clark and Peter Steinberg. Thank you, Bashan. Yeah, thanks. And uh, welcome, Heather. Thanks for joining me at, at this Politics and Prose hosted event. Thanks, um, Peter. <laughs> we thought a nice way to start this evening would be to have Heather read for a few minutes from Red Comet. Yeah, before I do that, I just want to take a minute to thank you, Peter, because you have been so helpful to me over the course of um, you know, the past eight years writing this book. And you, uh, you answered questions, so many questions. You pointed me to sources. You read a 1600 page <laughs> draft of this manuscript really, really quickly. Um, and got back to me with corrections. And, and I just appreciate it so much. And I wanna say, I think that you, you have upped everyone's game in Plath studies and Plath scholarship and uh, the, your editing of the letters was extraordinary. So I just wanted to take this public occasion to thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. You're thank welcome. you. Um, all right. I, I am not going to read for a long time because um, I, I know that that sometimes reading doesn't translate as well over Zoom, but I will read a, a short portion from my prologue. It's about three and a half, four minutes. Um, and I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it gives you a good sense of Sylvia Plath's ambition, but also what she was up against, uh, which is one of the, the big themes in, in my book. So. Sylvia Plath took herself and her desires seriously in a world that often refused to do so. She published her first poem at age eight and later vowed to become the poetess of America. In the years that followed, Plath pursued her literary vocation with a fierce, tireless determination. She hoped to be a writer, wife, and mother, but she was raised in a culture that openly derided female artistic ambition. Such derision is clear in the speech Democratic presidential candidate Adlai Stevenson gave at Plath's 1955 Smith College commencement titled, A Purpose for Modern Woman. The best way these brilliant graduates could contribute to their nation, Stevenson said, was to embrace, quote, the humble role of housewife, which statistically is what most of you are going to be, whether you like the idea or not just now and you'll like it, unquote. Stevenson, the liberal darling of his day, went on, and I'm quoting again from his commencement speech. 
This assignment for you as wives and mothers has great advantages. In the first place, it is homework. You can do it in the living room with a baby in your lap or in the kitchen with a can opener in your hands. If you're really clever, maybe you can even practice your saving arts on that unsuspecting man while he's watching television. Stevenson acknowledged the sense of contraction, the lost horizons these women would feel in their new domestic roles. Once they wrote poetry, he mused, now it's the laundry list. They had hoped to play their part in the crisis of the age, but what they do is wash diapers. Stevenson hoped this view was not too depressing, but concluded the quote, women never had it so good as you do, unquote. Sylvia Plath was determined to play her part, but as Stevenson's speech suggests, the odds were against her. She lived in a shamelessly discriminatory age when it was almost impossible for a woman to get a mortgage, loan, or credit card. When newspapers divided their employment ads between men and women, attractive please, the word pregnant was banned from network television and popular magazines encouraged wives to remain quiet because as one advice columnist put it, his topics of conversation are more important than yours. Government, finance, law, media, academia, medicine, technology, science, nearly all the professions were controlled by men. Some women made inroads, but the costs were high. As one of Plath's Cambridge University contemporaries wrote, women in the 1950s had quote, internalized from a lifetime of messages that achievement and autonomy were simply incompatible with love and family and that independence equaled loneliness. Still, Plath thought a different fate from the one Stevenson had predicted for her might be possible. Like her Joycean hero, Stephen Dedalus, she was filled with what she called Icarian lust. She would seek out her destiny abroad, collect experience for her art, and stay in motion. Anything to evade the life not lived, the poem not written, the love not realized. Plath spread her wings over and over at a time when women were not supposed to fly. And that's, that's, uh, that's it. I, I thought it was appropriate because it's a little bit po political, right? We're at politics right. and prose and I'm you know, mentioning Adley Stevenson, so. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have anything, before we start, do you have anything that you'd like to show off? Oh yes, I do actually. Uh, so just today in the mail, um, the book arrived. I saw it for the first time. I, wow. It's about three inches. The spine is quite beautiful. The cover is quite beautiful. It's, it's, it is stunning. So um, and it's very, got some blurbs on the back, but as you can see, it's, <laughs> I need two hands to pick it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, That's... it's, uh, it's, a, it's about 1100 pages. Little... Have you weighed it? I think it's, someone told me it was about three and a half pounds. So. Okay. All right. That's healthy. That's... <laughs> it's healthy. Yeah. Um, so when did you get the idea to write a biography of Sylvia Plath and what was the impetus to actually go for it? Yeah, you know, I, Peter, I don't actually think we've ever talked about this. And we've we've been having a conversation for so many years, but I don't I don't think we've ever, um, yeah, covered this particular subject. I I started thinking about it when I was working on my second book, uh, The Grief of Influence, about Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes' creative partnership and uh, studying the idea of mutual influence in their in their poetry. And at the time, I was thinking that Sylvia Plath really needed a, a longer, sort of more in-depth uh, biography because most of the biographies that existed maxed out at about 350, 400 pages, which is a fine length for a biography, right? I'm not knocking that um, right. at all. But I just thought there was room for uh, a doorstopper for her. Mm -hmm. and, I, and of course I had in the back of my mind, Hermione Lee's Virginia Woolf biography, which was so inspiring to me. And, and I thought that, that Plath was someone who deserved a book like that and that she, mm -hmm. she sort of deserved 
that big spine, she deserved to take up space on the bookshelf. You know, I just, mm -hmm. I guess I wanted her to take up more space, you know? Right. Um, in <laughs> sort of physically and in and, and all the other ways. And so that was just a practical thought that I had that I'm, you know, I might be able to convince someone to publish a longer biography of Plath because there wasn't one. And, right. and of course, the first thing everyone asks is, well, why do we need another biography of Sylvia Plath, right? And I knew I would have to, I would have to argue that one was necessary. Um, so a, a long in-depth literary biography didn't exist. Also, I knew that your, your collected uh, letters you know, that, that you and Karen were editing, I knew that was coming down the, the pike. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be published in you know, 2017, 2018. And so that, that was a huge consideration for me because uh, I mean, that again, that was just a game changing moment in Plath scholarship to have her 3000, how many letters was it? Three? Uh, we're up to about, it was ultimately it was about a little over 1400. Yeah. I've gotten more since then though. So, there, you know, we're creeping up towards 1430. So just you know, a massive amount of Sylvia Plath's letters that, that had never been published before. So we get to hear her in her own voice. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, that, that just made the project a lot easier. I mean, I'd taken pictures of a lot of those letters already, but I didn't, I certainly didn't have all of them. Um, right. you, you and Karen just did a fantastic job tracking down every, every last surviving Plath letter. So, Thank you. Um, <laughs> so that I knew that was coming. I knew that would make, that would, that made the project a little bit less intimidating to know uh, that was down the pike. And also I knew that I knew from having consulted the, the Ted Hughes archives at Emory and the British library, that there, there was more there to be mined. Right. Um, I thought, okay, there's just, there's just more to this story that I can, I can bring because of the new materials partly. Mm -hmm. And so that was another very practical reason. And then of course, I also wanted to tackle some of the reductive, uh, cliches that I think have dogged Plath's legacy mm -hmm. for a long time as, as someone kind of, as, as a writer whose name is often synonymous with madness and tragedy. Right. And I, I was very inspired by a quote I read in another Hermione Lee book about biography. And it, it, I quoted in my prologue and it's something like, Women writers whose lives have, have involved mental illness, self-harm, abuse, suicide, are often treated as victims first and psych victims and psychological case histories first and professional writers second. Right. And that was the, the quote that just cinched it for me. That just yeah. lit the fire because that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to give, to treat Plath foremost as a professional writer while still honoring the you know those other parts of her life she did right. suffer from depression right and right. still honoring that um but but trying to center the literary ambition the the literary achievements um the energy the strength the determination so uh that that was something that was was also you know, I was I hope to kind of dismantle some of that that legacy um, and yeah and that uh, so that's really those all those things basically yeah. coalesced in my mind and I just felt like it was fifty years over fifty years since Sylvia Plath's death and it seemed like enough time had gone by and it was things were just a little bit less raw it was a good time for a reappraisal right you yeah. know so. Um, I, I went for it. I, it was a very, for a long time, I tried to just talk myself out of it because I was so intimidated by Plath, by her brilliance. But it just was one of those things that I, I kept thinking about, right? Yeah. I kept, when I was looking for a third project, I just, I just couldn't, I just kept coming back to it. And mm -hmm. so. Well, I, I, think, I, I think you have successfully turned things around a bit and you have focused a lot more where the focus needs to be, which is on her work, her productivity, her her the success she had in her life, uh, publishing and writing and and becoming a parent and and overcoming a lot of the obstacles yeah. that that yeah. she faced, 
And I think Red Comet truly fulfills um, what you were trying to do. I appreciate that. Yeah, overcoming is, is a great word to use. Yeah. I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. From the beginning of the project to the end, did your vision of the book change at all and how? For example, the initial reports called it a literary biography, but more recently you've referred to it as a critical biography. Is there a difference? You know, there is not. <laughs> I, okay. think I've, I think I've just been using those terms interchangeably. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but thank you for asking. Okay. Um, I would, I would definitely call this a, a literary biography. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, my the question that I would always come back to throughout the course of writing this book, it that didn't change. That that one question that I use to try to guide my research and guide my writing and try to simplify things when I began to get overwhelmed right, with all of the information, just as you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a lot of it. She left yeah, a vast yeah. paper trail, which is yeah. fantastic, but that's a big challenge for a biographer to try to distill so, so much. Um, adolescent journals that are unpublished, published journals, pub le letters, unpublished um, poems, calendars, you know, it just goes on and on. Yeah, so yeah. the question that I would keep coming back to was, what made Sylvia Plath the writer that she became? Or how did Sylvia Plath become the writer that she became? And that sounds very simple, almost ridiculously simple, but that was what I tried to um, stay true to. So that never changed. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, yes, my, my sense of her did change throughout the writing of this book, simply because I got to to know her better, right? right. And the letters really helped with that. Oh. Um, seeing seeing different different sides of Sylvia Plath, different facets. Mm -hmm. um, seeing her in some of her most vulnerable moments, those 14 letters that she wrote to Dr. Ruth Boischer, which were published for the first time in, yeah. in the letters. I mean, those, those 14 letters were I think some of the most important pieces of evidence or whatever you know that I yeah, that yeah. I read in, in right. the eight years that I was writing this book. So my I simply got to know her better through her own voice. My, I I don't think I quite realized at the beginning of this book what a fighter she was and just how how many barriers she had to kind of break through and overcome. I mean, you read books about the 1950s, you see movies set in the 1950s, you think you sort of understand just how tough it was for women with professional ambitions at that time. But I think until I really immersed myself in the correspondence, in the women's magazines, you know, in um, just the, the other other correspondence that, that she received official mm -hmm. um, correspondence from publishers, rejections, that kind of thing. That that made me realize just how how strong she had to be. She really had an iron will. She yeah. just had an iron determination, yeah. which which I think is at odds with this again sort of more cliched version of Sylvia Plath as someone who was fragile and didn't have a strong sense of her self identity and which maybe that was true at some points when she right. was suffering from severe depression. But, but in general, I was just so impressed by this, this strength right. that she had, this will, right. yeah. will to, to just honor her vocation, to be, mm -hmm. to be the writer that she knew she was destined to become. She, she never veered from that. And that, right. that takes so much strength. Right. And so she'd done that, it twice because she she not only did it for Ted Hughes. Yes, exactly. Yes, she created Ted Hughes in a yes, way. Yeah. Um, while while effacing herself for the first several years. Yeah. You know, she, putting she, herself she, secondary. Yeah. But then, but then also, you know, developing into the poet and to the writer that she wanted to be at the same time. So she did yeah. it twice. Yeah, and I and I do wonder if Hughes would have gone on to to become you know become the the writer that he became without 
her help, right? right. Because she almost launched him. Right. So yeah, I mean, she, as we know, we, we've seen her submission lists and she just, she was, she was so organized and efficient and- Meticulous. Meticulous. If you wanted something done, give it to Sylvia Plath. Exactly. She, she will do it. Right. She was just a machine. Right. And I, I didn't quite, I mean, I, I had no, I knew a little bit from the previous book, but right, you know, writing this book gave me just such a greater appreciation mm -hmm. for that almost indomitable you know, right. spirit and will that she had. Right. So. Um, shifting a little bit of focus, um, so you interviewed a lot of people that knew Sylvia Plath. Were there any of her friends or acquaintances that like gave you just absolute gold nuggets of information or that told you stories that just mm. opened and blossomed Plath up a little bit more? Yeah, there were. Um, I'm thinking about people like Lorna Secker Walker, mm -hmm. who was Sylvia Plath's friend in London. And uh, I interviewed her and she told me about her, her last visit with Sylvia the week before Sylvia's death. And then that was, you know, I'd never heard that before, this, this meeting that they had um, and, and Sylvia wasn't in very good shape, but just to hear the, those details of, of, she thought it was the Wednesday or the Thursday before. And then of course, the, the last phone call that Sylvia made to her and what they talked about and all of that. I, had, I hadn't heard any of that before. And that was, that was quite moving. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then also in London, uh, speaking with Ruth Fainlight, about about Elm and oh, yeah. Sylvia dedicated Elm to Ruth Fainlight. And so we, we spent a lot of time actually talking about that poem. And I had this sort of, I had a sense that Elm had been influenced by one of Ruth's poems called Sapphic Moon. Yeah. And I, I brought up this theory to Ruth and, and we sort of debated it for a while. And, and that, again, that was an incredible experience because Ruth was sort of thinking, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe she did. <laughs> maybe I did influence her. But so, um, so that was another, you know, just something that I'll, I'll never forget. Um, Louise, Louise Geisy White, who was one of Plath's friends at Smith, mm -hmm. another very moving story. Uh, she told me about, uh, being at Wellesley High together. And Louise was the student who won the award for the, the best, best female student of the year. It was right. an academic award. And Sylvia didn't win. And, and Louise said that when the award was announced, she was so embarrassed because she knew Sylvia wanted it so badly. Mm -hmm. So Louise went to the ladies' room to cry. Oh. And who did she find in the ladies' room crying? Sylvia. Mm -hmm. And so here they are, they're both <laughs> crying because um, of this, this award. And so that was, they're, they're small stories, but they're, there's something about them that, that really moved me. Uh, John Rosenthal, one of Sylvia Plath's uh, boyfriend, well, I don't know if I should say boyfriend, she, they dated. He talked about driving back from Stowe with her in the car and she was, uh, opening up to him about her reasons um, for her first suicide attempt. So he was, he still remembered that and very clearly. Um, Suzette Macedo in London sort of, she had a slightly different story about the last mm -hmm. weekend, which is in the book. And right. um, so uh, Janet Rosenberg, one of Plas Smith's friends telling me about how much she thought Sylvia changed when she returned to Smith in right. 1954 and how their friendship kind of devolved. And so just, yeah, I mean, things like that, that, yeah. that I just found quite, quite moving, small, smaller, small right. aspects of the story, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nice to see that so many people are, were still alive to remember Plath. And I know some of them have since passed away like yeah. Elizabeth Sigmund, yeah. uh, Al Alvarez, and so on. Yeah. Um, so it, it's nice to, to sort of get 
something more authentic, I think, because they, they actually knew her and it, the, you know, living in a different way than say documents are living in the archive. Yeah, absolutely. It was one of the privileges of my life mm -hmm. to meet these people. And I'm yeah. so grateful to them for sharing their memories. Um, yeah. And also Ted Hughes's friends as well. I mean, I, I remember sitting on a stone wall across the street from 18 Rugby Street, which was the townhouse that Ted Hughes had lived in and uh, Sylvie Plath and Ted Hughes spent their wedding night there. And one of Ted Hughes's close friends, um, his father had owned that townhouse. And he just he just gave me an oral history of every floor of the townhouse <laughs> in Bloomsbury. And we sat there for, I don't know, a couple hours, just mm -hmm. this incredible detailed history. So so things like that as well. Um, it just, every, all of it helped. Yeah. All of it helped. Great. Yeah. Um, you've told me that the original manuscript was much larger than what's been published. How hard was it to cut it down so significantly and what was lost? Yeah, it, it was quite long. Uh, it was, I think, almost 2,000 pages. Mm -hmm. And I cut, uh, I think, about 300. And this is also, this is my part of my writing process, right? right. Is just to write a lot and then to, to whittle it down. Okay. Um, other people have different different processes, but, mm -hmm. but I never, I never intended it to be, to be this long. I, oh. I thought maybe it would be a, a six, six or 700 pager, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't, I didn't quite realize um, how much detail I guess I wanted to include. And, and once you start writing and you start, you have this certain level of detail yeah. <laughs> in the beginning, you, you feel compelled to keep it up. Um, but what was lost was, or what was cut was mostly from the first half mm -hmm. um, or almost all from the first half. I had a lot more about Dick Norton, for example, um, because I had read all of his letters. Yeah. And in Brave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he's the basis for Buddy Willard, right? In the bell jar. So I felt like he was an important person in her life and that he, he was another one who, who's, I, I just thought more could be said about that relationship. And yeah. um, so, but a lot of that got cut. Uh, Gordon Lemire, similar, uh, Richard Sassoon. And so some of, so some of that, the, the dating <laughs> um, that got cut, uh, things from her adolescence and childhood. It, I, I really trusted the judgment of my editor because at that point I felt too close to the book and yeah. I just sort of said, okay, tell me, tell me what goes. Also, I would sometimes go on these literary historical benders. <laughs> where I would just get so interested in, in a, a, a subject that didn't directly apply to plot. For example, uh, once I started researching the beats and whether or not the beats had influenced Sylvia or Ted, mm -hmm. uh, I, I just became really, uh, just really interested in, in this comparison. And I, I ended up writing 30 pages about it or, or okay. what have you. And then that became three paragraphs in the book, right? So right, right. <laughs> it just, there were a lot of moments like that too, these sort of literary historical um, side trips that I would yeah. take and, and uh, my editor would, would reel me in. And yeah. so, but, but it's, but it's still there, right? It still it still informs the the work. Right. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so even with the cuts, the material in the book on Plath's first suicide attempt and recovery was really illuminating. Um, how important was it to clarify this murky period in in late 1953 and early 1954? And can you discuss any of your experiences at McLean Hospital? And I should say researching at <laughs> McLean Hospital. Oh, yes. Um, I, I had a wonderful experience there. I met with the archivist who was, again, very generous with his time and um, spent the afternoon with him. We, we talked a lot about treatments that... <clears throat> were were being you know 
were being performed were popular, what have you, at McLean in, in 1953, 1954. Uh, he gave me a tour of the grounds and uh, you know, obviously showed me where Plath would have would have lived. And mm -hmm. um, and then he also helped me get a hold of some 1953 and 54 internal McLean newsletters. Oh, the Gazette? Yeah, so that that was that gave me a lot of context, right, for the time and the treatment and, and even the photos in those, right? Yeah. They're they're really illuminating. Um, and then of course the Rosenstein, there, there's material in the Rosenstein files, yeah. which do you want to tell everyone what, about what the Rosenstein files are? <laughs> so Harriet, Ro I see, I say Rosenstein. Well, I'm uh, sorry, yeah. No, I'm not sure which it is. Okay. I see E-I-N and I, I'm Steinberg, so I, I assume she's Rosenstein. Um, she was an early researcher and, and biographer, uh, would-be biographer of Plath in the 1970s. And she uh, interviewed a lot of people, recorded them, uh, made notes. Uh, she apparently accumulated hundreds of letters uh, by Plath, although only 15 survive in her archive. 15 new ones, I should say. And, um, and so she, she was working on this in the 70s and then virtually disappeared from the Plath world after Letters Home came out in 1975. Um, and sat on this information for, my math is bad, 45, 50 years uh, until it was suddenly um, made available for sale after the passing of Olwyn Hughes, Ted Hughes's sister. Uh, so there was a period of time, what was it, two years about, where um, That's right, we yeah. knew about the archive, but we couldn't have access to the archive. Uh, and eventually it ended up at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia and was open for research in early January of this year. So that's, that's I think, Harriet Rosenstein yeah. in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's, so, and yeah, so her research notes um, were so quite illuminating. revealing. <laughs> yeah, very revealing, yeah. And, and that, that, those were brand new. I mean, nobody had seen those before. I mean, they hadn't been open to researchers Right. And, and she hadn't been open to research. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I, the for example, the Pat O'Neill Prattson file. So Pat O'Neill was was one of Sylvia Plath's closest friends. And when Harriet interviewed her, she talked a lot about the period when Sylvia was missing and she was in the house and she, there were all kinds of details about what was going on in the house at the time when they were searching for Sylvia, how Sylvia was found, um, really moving conversations that she had with Sylvia beforehand, mm -hmm. you know, when she returned from New York and, and things like that. And also Marsha Brown, one mm -hmm. of, another one of Sylvia's friends um, spoke about this time as well. So a lot of those interviews from Plath's friends, her, her Smith friends and Wellesley friends in, the, in, in those files, in the mm -hmm. Rosenstein files, those were, I, I, I think, shed so much light on, yeah. on that period. And also the interviews, her interviews with Dr. Ruth Boisher yeah. shed and, yeah. light. Yeah, um, it, and, and in some ways, this holding back of material benefited you yeah. immensely it did. And, and the timing of it and, and with the duration that it took you to work on this book and, yeah. and every single minute of it was well spent and and I know I wanted this book several years ago as did everyone else yeah. but the waiting period and even for the letters of Sylvia Plath like the 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 delays that came into it really benefited everybody because you get access yeah. to the material yeah and especially as I was saying before those those letters those 14 letters yeah. in, in your edition of the letters from Plath to Dr. Boisher yeah. um, those were just so incredibly powerful and I can't even imagine this book not including those or quoting right. from them and um, so so yeah it was <laughs> the fact that it took a long time I guess was serendipitous in that mm -hmm. In that way, yeah. Um, I did. I mean, I, I did know that the letters were coming out, but I didn't know that 
the Rosenstein archive was that that was not I didn't know about that until the the very later yeah. stages. I had written to her asking if she you know she would inter if I could interview her right you, you know that she yeah. said but she she was such an incredible researcher. I yeah, mean, she hats off to her. She was yeah she was fantastic and in in pre the pre internet age right the so, materials that she acquired were are. I mean, they're things that people didn't know about for decades. Yeah. So it's 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 quite incredible. It's, it's incredible. It's very valuable. Even Otto Plath. Yeah. That was those the interviews in the Otto Plath file. She she tracked down men who had known mm -hmm. Otto, and right. they were they were in their seventies or eighties, right. but they had they remembered him, and yeah. so because I I feel like Otto's a bit of a black hole. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I really enjoyed reading those those stories about him that humanized him a bit right. more. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, no, there's incredible. And of course the information at the, in the Dr. Horder file about what was happening at the end. And mm -hmm. um, there were just pieces of the puzzle that were starting to fall in place, I think, yeah. in, those, in those files. And I haven't listened to the tapes yet. So I don't right. even, I mean, those weren't available when I was, <laughs> right. so there's still more. And, and I say right. in my prologue, like, this is not, th th there's, there will be another biography coming down the pike and another and another. And mm -hmm. because there will be m new material and there will be m new yeah. perspectives and definitely, and that's all good, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is yeah. all good. Yeah. Uh, you gained access to 23 Fitzroy Road. Uh, what was that like? Again, just one of the most incredible experiences of my life because yeah. I was able to see the bedroom study where Sylvia Plath wrote some of her greatest poems. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was able, I, I didn't take any photos in that, um, in the house, but I, I did ask if I could take a photo of the window. Mm -hmm. that Oh, looking out. Yeah. The window yeah. looking out and, uh, and the owner told me that I could, and that's in the book because I just, I thought that that view was so important that mm -hmm. this was what she might've been looking at um, while she was yeah. writing. Yeah. So uh, it, the house is relative, the, relatively unchanged at least on the upper floors. And um, wow. yeah, no, it was, it was incredible. That's pretty, I've never known anybody to, to get in there. So that's, that's pretty awesome. I was, I, I wrote to her, I told her about the biography and mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I just got lucky, I think. Yeah. Yep. Um, your Twitter handle is at Plath Biography. <laughs> Are you going to change it? I, I don't think so actually. I, because my next, my next book is partly about Sylvia Plath too. Okay. Um, I think I may just leave it. Okay as it is yeah well your next two books right yes <laughs> yeah i'm working on a, an introduction one of those um right. oup introductions very short introductions can you just publish the material that was cut from red comet <laughs> as the oxford please no because i'd like to see it <laughs> that you know that's such a different kind of that's just such a yeah God, this this was a marathon, right? Mm -hmm. Now now it's a sprint, so it's just yeah. completely different, right? Um, style of writing, and it's it's actually very difficult. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did did not Knopf ever impose on you like a final 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 deadline, or was there flexibility, and it was up to you to submit to them this this printable manuscript? Yeah, um, they were they were flexible. Okay. So I, I signed the contract in January, 2012. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, but I was giving them chapters all along. So okay. yeah. <laughs> I think they, they knew it was, you know, I was working and right. um, I was, I was being diligent. I had a baby uh, mm -hmm. two years into the project. I, I, I had a three-year-old daughter and then two years, maybe even less than I had, uh, weren't you pregnant son. at the Plath Symposium at Indiana in 2012? Was it, yeah, I must have been because my son was born in 2013. So yeah, it was yeah. it was actually pretty okay. soon after I had yeah. signed the contract. Um, 
so that was a challenge, yeah. you know, just uh, right finding the time to write and finding mm-hmm. finding the time to go abroad to go to England to do these research trips, mm-hmm. and that was that was a, a a very big challenge actually, and I I had doubts along the way of can I do this right? Can I have right. these two little kids and actually do this, finish this book? And you know who would inspire me it was Sylvia Plath because. Mm-hmm she yeah again she just managed her time so well look what she did with with two toddlers running around i mean she yeah. so uh, she was such an inspiration as a mother as well on in mm-hmm. that sense and um and i was able to for some of the longer research trips for example i went to yorkshire in 2017 and I spent five weeks living at Ted Hughes's house. Um, the University of Huddersfield had asked me to be a visiting professor there that summer mm-hmm. and arranged for me to stay in Ted Hughes's house very, very generously. And so that allowed me to bring my kids, bring my husband, bring my mom. Right. <laughs> and and that, that made things so much easier on me. And mm-hmm. uh, I was able to spend a lot of time in that landscape that had inspired Plath so much and Hughes yeah. and um, just walking those moors. I think that that was one of the, the one of my most favorite things that I did over, during the course of writing this book was just taking that hike out to mm-hmm. Wuthering Heights. There's a ruined farmhouse out, out in the West Yorkshire moors called Top Withens and it's the alleged site of, of Wuthering Heights. And there's mm-hmm. a, a trail that you can take from the Bronte Parsonage in Haworth where the, the Bronte sisters lived. And, um, and Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes used to take that, they used to hike that. Yeah. And they were kind of invested in the ha- Kathy and Heathcliff mm-hmm. myth. Yeah. And so I, I just, I loved, I loved that landscape. I loved immersing myself in that landscape. That was really transformative. Yeah. Um, but no, these books take a long time to write. And I'm very grateful to Knopf for giving me the time and the page space mm-hmm. to, to, write, to write a big book. And I, I, I really appreciate that. I don't take that for granted at all. Yeah. Um, editor Deb Garrison has been really supportive. Right. So hats off to Knopf. Yes, thank you, Knopf. <laughs> and, and, and I know publication was delayed a few times because of the pandemic, but not even a pandemic could stop this book from coming out now um, at a good time when I think we all probably need some distraction from what's going on to, to read about an historical figure who has a profound impact on, on us. And, and thank you so much for writing this book. Well, thank you for your help, Peter. And platulations. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Um, so um, it's quarter of. Do you feel like answering a few questions sure. from the audience? Yeah, sure. All right. There are several here. Uh, one is, what was Sylvia Plath's husband like? Wow. Well, this is really a very big question. And <laughs> I've spent a lot of time studying um, Plath and Hughes. My second book was all about their kind of poetic partnership, if you will. And that, that was an academic book really. And that, and I wanted, in this book, I was able to kind of read more, uh, write more biographically Mm -hmm. about them um, in Mm -hmm. ways that I hadn't in, in the other book. So, I mean, I think, I think that we're all familiar with, the end of the story and the, the end of the marriage was was really was terrible and and it's heartbreaking right mm-hmm. it is heartbreaking to read those letters um, and i in the book i i felt like i needed to center sylvia plath's voice um, when it came to the breakdown of the marriage so i, I quoted very heavily from those letters you'll see in those later chapters, um, like I've got just some big block quotes from the letters because I I just, I wanted, I just wanted to center her voice and try to take a step back. Um, So, so that's all, you know, it's all, it's all there. And now again, we have, we have her voice because of these letters. So I think it's, it's easier to fill in some of those blanks. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also, you know, I spend, 
the early years of the marriage were happier. They were more productive. Um, there was a lot of a lot of work got done, a lot of important work. So I tried to to uh, delve into that as well. I mean, I mean, I think the Colossus, Ariel, the Hawk in the Rain, Lupercal, the yeah. Bell Jar, um, all written in a, in a very short time. So um, a tempestuous marriage, absolutely, especially yeah. towards the end, but, but also in the beginning, um, quite productive in terms yeah. of uh, the output for 20th century literature. Yeah. Um, another question is, you said that you got to know Plath better by immersing yourself in her voice. What was something unexpected that you learned that changed your perception of Plath? Hmm. Unexpected. I have to say, I was, some of her uh, nastier moments, I think, <laughs> could shock me. Um, when, when she would make these comments about, for example, uh, career women, right? She mm -hmm. would mock career women or call her her female professors at Cambridge grotesques, and um, yeah, and she she could be really nasty about women who didn't have children. You know, she called barren women right. that kind of thing, and and of course, Plath is such a feminist icon, and so these moments just were shocking to me, yeah. <laughs> and but I think. I think that you know she was living in this in a very sexist era and she didn't want to have to choose between having a family and having a literary career. Right. And for I think obviously Plath died before second wave feminism became a mainstream, you know, so she she died before I think it was what eight days before Betty Friedan published like that, yeah. The Feminine Mystique. I mean it was yeah. it was really close. So she didn't really live to see the fruits of second wave feminism. But I think for her, part of her feminism was, was rebelling against this idea that she, she could not have children or she could not right. marry. She couldn't have a domestic life if she wanted to be the great writer that, that she wanted to be. And that, right. so, so I think that those moments of nastiness, um, She's, she's, it's, it's a kind of anger that she's expressing that she is also forced to make these decisions and she, she doesn't want to have to make them. It's not, right. she, she understands it's not fair that she has to make them. And, you know, to her credit, she, she did combine all of those things. She wanted it all. And for right. a long time, she had it all. Yeah. Um, she was, she, she, you remember Peter, she said she wanted to be a triple threat woman. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, so and again, that that was, she came of age in an era that did not encourage women to pursue these lofty professional goals. Ne never mind become the greatest poet of your generation. I yeah. mean, so, so yeah, that surprised me, but I also think I was also trying, I, I tried to see it in its historical context, I guess mm -hmm. is what I'm saying, so. Yeah. Uh, I like this one. Any sense of Sylvia Plath as a mother? Yeah, I think she. I think she was a great mother. I think she was a wonderful mother. Um, I think that at the very end, when when she was having a severe a severe, she was in the midst of a severe depression. Um, it, that was when things got really tough for her, mm -hmm. and she needed help with her children, but. In the letters, especially, you you see it. You see, she writes so much about her love for her children. And I remember one letter she calls Frida. Oh, she's such a, a sunshiny thing, and and she she is very observant of them. And people uh, who who knew her said that also said you know, she was a, a good mother. She that she could she could be a bit more Germanic in her approach, right? She wasn't somebody who who necessarily adhered to this more rambunctious style of child rearing. She was very orderly. Yeah. Um, 
but but yeah I mean I think I think she was a, a good mother okay um I like this question uh, it's a quick question did you get to visit Yaddo as part of your research and I know the answer but I'd like you to talk about it Yes, and it was two weeks of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, Yado! I can't say enough good things about it. I, I could only get away from um, family responsibilities for two weeks. That was, because again, I had small children. Mm -hmm. But those two weeks were heavenly and I got to, it was part of my research, right? While I was there, I was researching Plath and Hughes, and again, trying to follow in their footsteps as much as I could. And, and I saw the, the room that they slept in. I saw Hughes's study uh, outlook, which was out in the, the back. I saw Plath's study. Um, I ended up meeting people who knew uh, the Nortons very well at Yaddo, just randomly. <laughs> yeah. and, and actually hearing stories about Wellesley and Aurelia Plath and things like just completely by luck. So that was serendipitous. Uh, I ended up interviewing Howard Rogovin, who was uh, one of the guests at Yaddo when yeah. Plath and Hughes were guests there. And, and Hughes and uh, Howard Rogovin became very, well, at least at, at that time, they, they were close at Yaddo. And he, mm -hmm. Howard painted a, a portrait of, of Sylvia Plath. And so I interviewed him on the phone and I was actually living in the room that he had lived in at Yada. Oh, so that was yeah. really cool. And, and he was saying like, oh, there was, you know, in, in Ted's poem, he writes about a snake. There was no snake and you know, that kind of thing. So <laughs> I had a nice conversation with him. Um, and yeah, it, it was when Sylvia talked about the food at Yado. I, I understood because the, right. the food is, is just second to none. And mm. yeah, so, and for somebody, so I was in this position, um, I, I had two kids, just a lot of family responsibilities. And it was that, I think Yado is especially amazing for mothers with small children. Yeah. And, and I think for, to just have that time, that headspace, right? Yeah. It was just my own. It was like I was in this monastery uh, that I got a lot done there. And so when I read about Plath's experience at Yado, and she was pregnant at the time with her first child, yeah. but I think the same, I think she, there was a similar dynamic there where she could finally work in her own space without cooking and cleaning. And because she did all of those things in, mm -hmm. in the marriage. And, um, but she didn't have to do any of that at Yado. She, right. she, 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 she could just write. And Ted was not in the same room. He was right, <laughs> in right. a study a few, 10 minutes walk away. And she, yeah. she said that was really good for them. Yeah. And she, I think that that's one of the reasons why she had this breakthrough, this aesthetic breakthrough at Yado, yeah. because she just had a room of her own, mm -hmm. finally. And um, so, so I think Yado was in incredibly important for her, right? She wrote the Colossus there and mm -hmm. the poem for her birthday, Sequence yeah. of the Stone. So um, yeah, the greenhouse is not there though anymore. Oh, bummer. No, so, but, the, but I- I, I always been, imagined it was like this derelict sort of building. So I'm not surprised. Me too. No, they, it's, it's gone. There's a new structure there, but I was able to at least go see where, where it was. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Uh, one more, I think. Um, I'm curious if she found much information on Plath's relationship with Anne Sexton. Yeah, I, that, you know, that's something I'm so fascinated by that. And I know Gail Crowther, you should read Gail Crowther's book because she has a book coming out on Plath and Sexton, right? And I think it's coming out pretty soon. April right? 21st, 2021. Yeah, April 21st. So that will, <laughs> I'm sure that will shed lots of light on, on yeah. that relationship because it's a really important relationship, right? I, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what I, I think that in the beginning, Sexton influenced Plath more. Um, yeah. So, so Sylvia Plath met Anne Sexton when she was living in Boston um, in her, her sort of 1958, 1959 year. They, both took Robert Lowell's creative writing class and 
famously met after class for martinis and uh, the fit the the line that often gets repeated is uh, Anne Sexton said they parked in the loading zone because they were only there to get loaded. Mm-hmm. Which I think is still really funny. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'll drink to that. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, uh, I think Plath learned a lot from Robert Lowell and Anne Sexton in that class. Robert Lowell was workshopping parts of life studies right. in, in a creative writing class. Can you imagine? I right. mean, you're reading Skunk Hour <laughs> right. for the first time. That's one of the most important books of, of the 20th century. He was workshopping poems from that. And Sexton was workshopping poems like The Double Image and You, Dr. Martin. And I think that just reading their work, they, they had both experienced depression and institutionalization and, and things that the Plath had experienced but didn't really feel comfortable writing about. And I think seeing their verse, um, seeing how good it was opened something up and she yeah. and she spoke so eloquently about their work in in later interviews and I so I don't think it's an accident that you know, she meets Sexton and Lowell in that creative writing class in the spring of 1959 and then a few months later she goes to Yado and mm-hmm. she's got a room of her own and she's right she's got the headspace she's she's not cooking three meals a day she's not right ironing and you know, grocery shopping. Mm-hmm. And that's where she really, it's this aesthetic turning point for her. Yeah. Um, and her lines start to loosen up a bit. And so I think the friendship with Sexton was incredibly important. Um, and also that Sexton centered women's experience in yeah. her poems as well. And this is something that that Plath had spoken about doing herself. And that, mm-hmm. and that Sexton had centered women's experience in such an unapologetic way. And right. that was sort of revolutionary yeah. at the time. And um, so again, read Gail Crowther's book when it's coming out, she'll, she'll mm-hmm. have a lot more. That's just very basic information there, but I'm sure Gail will have more to say. <laughs> all right, well, thank you, Heather. I thank you, Peter. That, thank you. I think that's all the questions that we'll take for this evening, but thank you all to everybody else who did submit a question. Thank you for coming. And thank you, yeah, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Before you do go, I wanted to ask you all, well, both of you, a question because we ask all of our authors, um, is there anything you're currently reading? And if so, could you please share that with uh, with everyone? Sure. Do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, I'm reading, uh, actually, I just finished, I should say, The Great Offshore Grounds by Vanessa Valselka and I absolutely loved it. It was nominated for a National Book Award. It, I think it's on the long list or the short list, but published by Knopf. Fantastic book set in Washington State, Alaska. Um, yeah, I loved it. I am reading the entire works, the novels of Thomas Hardy in reverse order. <laughs> Uh, and I'm doing that because Thomas Hardy is perfect pandemic reading because he shows you that it can always get worse. Oh my God. And I'm also hoping that the novels get less depressing as he gets younger, mm-hmm. but it's not proving true. <laughs> it's a false assumption. So that's what I'm reading. Well, thank you both uh, for this wonderful discussion. Thank you everyone who's tuned in and hope everyone has a good evening. Thanks, Pashan.